it is important just to note as a historical fact that people like the people in this room are now coming to a place where they think it is important to act in a different way and are so doing. Now I say that for because as a historian, and I worked in Paris, as a political economist and as a historian, it isn't always that people come to a place where they change something, brings them to a point of change personally. I think it's a big deal, historically, when that process begins to develop slowly beneath the surface. So I, people like us and friends of ours and many, many, many thousands of people if something's happened. And I think that's a terribly important moment in history when people begin to say, minimally, something is profoundly wrong. And secondarily, maybe I should do something different. Those are the prehistories, moments of prehistory, often, but not always, of moments of great change. Um, in the last but one book I wrote, I, I mentioned that my great heroes are people in the civil rights movement in the 1930s and 40s. The people who laid down the groundwork for the history that came. So I think that's who we are. And I think we are potentially the people laying down the groundwork, both in ideas, practice, models, experience, theories, and elements of change and in personal example of the history that might come. So I hadn't planned to talk about that, but that's, I think, a way to frame um, a much broader of the kind of concrete work we're going to be doing tomorrow and speaking about. So uh, by way of thinking about it, the second thing I wanted to say is uh, I'm a realist. <laughs> I think these are very difficult times. And one of the options is that there will be no change. A second is that there will be disaster. But also it is possible that great change can come. So you get to choose without knowing the outcome of whether this is a period like the quiet for many years before the Egyptian explosion, or the quiet before the civil rights explosion, or the feminist explosion, or the first environmental explosion, or whether it's just decay or violence. And my bet is on um, there's nothing for us to lose by trying to improve the chances of moving in the right direction. And just possibly, revolutions are as common as grass in world history. And if you take a perspective of that kind, um, there is a finite, in my view, realistic and plausible chance that we will, in fact, uh, overcome and begin to lay groundwork for something different. So uh, that's kind of an informing kind of vision, I think, of where we, where we are at the Democracy Collaborative and Ted and I and our gang think about it that way. So the second thing to say about that is <clears throat> we are really interested in systemic change. To put it in a narrow sense, we're not interested in Cleveland. Of course we're interested in Cleveland, but we're interested in whether or not the kinds of developments in Cleveland and elsewhere offer beginning paradigms not only for other communities but also principles that might extend and be built to a larger systemic change as well. And we've got some ideas about that, we've written some about that, but one way to think about it in a, in a general form is many of the, new, the, the ideas that became the basis of the New Deal, if not most, were first developed in the laboratories of the states and localities at that level and refined and developed in the principles adapted, which became the basis when the political moment occurred for larger structural change in the system itself. So that's always in the back of my mind and I think Ted's and our gang at the, at the Democracy Collaborative. What are the possible extensions upward as well as <clears throat> across sideways in a horizontal sense. So we think of models in that way as well. And we were talking, John and I, before, there could be a major crash in this country and there could be a political uprising of a positive or a negative kind. And the content of what that would bring forward is not developed properly. People don't know what they would do if they had a moment to re reform the finance system, 
to reform if you wanted to deal with growth in a serious way in a no-growth economy? How would you do it? So there is urgency about this time in really getting our ideas straight and then organized. So let me say a little bit more about one of the, or two of the principles that focus our work, uh, both in Cleveland and in general. We've been trying to study emergent political economic models that in one way or another democratize capital, democratize the ownership of capital. And we selected that particular focus for one of our focuses, or foci, was uh, because, you know, the numbers related to the distribution of income and wealth are extreme, but they also have political and democracy implications. The latest number I saw, and some of you, I looked at it 10 times. The top 400 wealth owners have more wealth than the bottom half of the society put together. That number is accurate. It's been double checked around, and I didn't believe it for a while. That's medieval. I don't mean that rhetorically. I mean the structure of medieval society was organized with a concentration of wealth that great, possibly not even that great. So the question becomes, can you have democracy as well as an ecologically stable system if you don't actually alter those distributional patterns in a democratic way? So part of what we're interested in in, in the many different models is that principle. And Cleveland illustrates the Evergreen Project, illustrates one way to do that. The, the second way to look at this is we've been watching the development and attempting to understand it as an evolution of different forms of reaching to this principle. So for over the last 30 years or 35 years, employee-owned companies, ESOPs and others, have gone from a few hundred to about 11, 13,000, I think 12.6 uh, million people involved. There are more people involved in worker-owned companies in the United States than there are members of unions in the private sector. What's interesting about that is the evolution over time. And in many instances, as time goes on, more democratization. Even though the ESOP form is the least democratized form, it is becoming more democratized over time. So the point about that is trajectory, trend, and evolution, again, of forms that might be valuable as part of, part of answering what do you want. Supposing you were able, actually, to say we want a systemic change. What do you want? And if you don't know what you want, why should we talk to you about it? That's nasty. That's a very nasty question. And it forces the question of democracy and change right onto everybody's plate. You want a sustainable, ecological, and dem democratic system? What does it look like? And why should I listen to you if you don't have any ideas about that? So we are forced to ask questions of this kind. And our particular way of answering it, of trying to answer it, is to struggle with these emergent models on the one hand, and with a certain series of principles and theories and developmental ideas that the academy, activists, and others, historians, have begun developing uh, in different ways. So if you look closely at the, the work done in Cleveland, one of the issues is how do you begin to stabilize the local economy in order also to achieve a democratic possibility and a democratic culture? So let me say something about that. You can't have, I, I agree with Tocqueville and Ben Barber and many theorists, can you have democracy with a big D in a system called the United States if you don't actually have people who in their own lives actually experience something called real democracy? Now, if that proposition is correct, and I think it's largely correct, that means you cannot have democracy until you rebuild the communities of, of the United States economically, politically, institutionally, and ecologically and making and sustainably. Very nasty. You, you see the test? The test is brutal, but that's the test we're forced to put before ourselves because if you can't answer that, what that means is the concentration of decision making ultimately is somebody else with the power and the finance. So the principle of working at a local community with that in mind and also building institutions that begin to involve democratic practice is not simply about a new, nice, a new structure that brings together worker and community ownership in a new pattern. It is about that. But it is about how you begin to broaden the base in any community so that the conditions of democratic participation and practice are sustainable and real. And they aren't in most American communities. 
which is one of the reasons the decision making is made by people who have other, uh, other values. It isn't simply who controls the parties, it's that the substructure, the whole culture, is not a Democrat culture. The participation rates and the understanding of what it is to be a citizen in a community is not real. That's very abstract and it's very nasty <laughs> because it forces us up against real problems of how you actually produce a systemic change. The values in this group and our own values coming from where I'm coming have a lot to do with ecological sustainability which ultimately takes you to priorities, to no growth or reduced growth, and to processes in a system level which require major national decisions. Supposing you were actually able to design a system that would begin to reduce growth, the material throughput. Supposing, and the, the argument for doing that is becoming more powerful day by day, for people in this room I don't need to tell. How would you do that in a way that was democratic? There are big allocation decisions made, this industry or that industry, capital allocations. Those are systemic change involved in the growth pattern, but it also requires you to have a substructure, if you want democracy, 